Amen. Well, if you will turn in your copy of God's Word this morning to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, we're going to look at verses 19 through 31 this morning. And really the latter part of that passage, uh, if you're a guest with us this morning, uh, what we normally do here at Bloomfield Baptist Church is we walk through the Scripture chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And so uh, we're actually in the midst of a study in the book of 1 Samuel and we'll be resuming that this coming Lord's Day. But last week and this week, we've paused in that study to look at the 20th chapter of John and to consider what we learn about the resurrection. And so last Lord's Day, we looked at the first part of this chapter and, and what it means to really understand the resurrection. We found that uh, the initial response of the disciples when they uh, heard of the empty tomb, uh, they didn't understand. It would take further revelation from Jesus for them to understand and comprehend and respond rightly to the resurrection. And that's what we'll see in today's passage. And so we're really going to look at the section of this chapter that deals with Thomas and with his doubts. Uh, But to understand the context of that, we're going to start there in verse 19 to better understand Thomas's doubts. And so out of reverence for God's word, if you're able to, if you would stand as I read today's passage for us. This is what the Holy Word of God says. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven of them. And if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas One of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands and the marks of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again. And Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it on my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. You may be seated. We come to this word this morning, and we are reminded of the events that took place following the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And so before we look to this word, I want to ask that we just pray for a moment that God might help us today, this day, to better understand the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. If you would pray with me. Father God, we thank you for your word And God, I pray in this moment, on this Resurrection Sunday, that you would do what only you can do through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you might help us not to disbelieve, but to believe. Not just to know these things, but to believe these things. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, about 30 years ago, There was a young lady who was starting her college studies. She had grown up in a 
a rural church, a rural community, not so different from Bloomfield. And at a young age, she had placed her faith in Jesus. And so uh, she decided that for her studies, she wanted to go to a, a Baptist college. She wanted to further her education, but also grow in her faith. And so uh, she enrolled in a Southern Baptist college. She signed up for a New Testament class because it was going to be taught by the son of Southern Baptist missionaries. And as she saw that, she thought, well, what insight this child of missionaries would bring to the New Testament. And so she went with many other students uh, to that first day of class expecting to, to learn so much about the New Testament. But she was a bit shocked when that teacher came out and after asking the students how many of them were Christians and most of them raised their hand, he made this statement. I want to encourage you now to drop this class. Because I will systematically destroy your faith in Jesus by the end of this semester. Well, she didn't drop the class, and many others didn't drop the class. But they certainly began to question their faith. As this professor, day after day, week after week, would give reason for doubt, would give suggestions that she had never heard about growing up, that the gospel may not be true, that there may be things in the scripture that aren't entirely accurate. As he would try to poke hole after hole after hole in the story of scripture, she began to question her faith. But in the providence of God, he brought some other believers into her life, believers who helped her to open up the scripture and see that these suggestions, these skeptical accusations they were nothing new and helped her to not doubt her faith but to actually grow in her faith as she wrestled through these questions she came out stronger on the other end i'm very thankful for that because she will go on to become my wife what sandy experienced as a freshman on the campus of a baptist college is what takes place on campuses all around the country day after day after day as people look to what it is we say we believe, that we believe that a man who said he would die and raise three days later, that he did that. That we believe not only that he was truly a man, but that he was truly God. That we believe that Jesus is Lord, that we believe that he's the conquering king who will return again. These things are foolishness to the world around us. For many of us, despite what the world may say, we believe and we believe firmly. But for others of us, we wrestle with questions. We struggle with doubts. And so it's fitting this morning that we come to a text in the Scripture where we find one of the disciples of Jesus struggling with doubts because perhaps you this morning have some doubts. Perhaps this morning you are struggling to believe, or perhaps you just have someone in your life, like that New Testament professor, who hurls accusation after accusation after accusation about what it is you believe. And so my hope is that as we walk through this passage today, we might better learn how we are to deal with these doubts and accusations, and that we might better understand what it means to believe in our risen Lord. And so we'll begin with that first point there in your outline. We find that by nature, we really all struggle with doubt and unbelief. And we see that here in Thomas. Now I read the context of the passage so that we could see clearly that Thomas wasn't there the first time when the risen Christ appears to the disciples. And Christ comes, he appears, the disciples believe, and then they recount these things to Thomas. But Thomas here is skeptical. Thomas here is doubting. And this is where Thomas earns the name that he's known by to so many. Doubting Thomas. As he hears the disciples recount what took place, he says to them that, that he's never going to believe unless he can actually touch the wounds of Jesus. And unless he can actually be there with the risen Christ and not just see him, but put his finger in his side, he says boldly, Unless that happens, he will not believe. Now, sadly for most of us, this is all we really think about when we think about Thomas. But the picture we see of Thomas up until this point isn't so much of one who doubts. 
It's of one who's boldly following Jesus. I mean, really, up to John chapter 20, that's what we learn about Thomas. You can go back to John chapter 11, and there, in John 11, is where Jesus and the disciples hear about Lazarus. And Lazarus being sick, and ultimately the death of Lazarus. And as Jesus is telling the disciples that he intends to go there, they're very concerned and worried because they know for Jesus to go there, there's going to be danger. But it's Thomas who makes the bold statement, Let us go also that we may die with him. So here we see this picture of Thomas. He's ready to die for Jesus. He's ready to die for following Jesus. Not so much a picture of doubt there, but one of trust. Then in John chapter 14, we read this in verse 1. Jesus says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Now as I read that, I wonder, how many of the disciples just sit there and they would nod, but they had no idea what Jesus was talking about? I mean, have you ever had that experience where someone says to you, you know what I'm talking about, and you don't have any clue what they're talking about? And you just hope somebody else will raise their hand and ask the question, what exactly did you mean by that? Well, that's what Thomas does here. I think the other disciples are probably, along with Thomas, not quite understanding what Jesus is saying because Thomas in verse 5 says what? Lord, we don't know the way to where you're going. How can we know the way? And that's when Jesus makes that very clear statement to Thomas, to the others, ultimately to us. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That was in response to Thomas's question. And so up to John chapter 20, we see Thomas as one who's willing to die with Jesus. We see Thomas as one who really wants to understand the teachings of Jesus. But then in chapter 20, we, we find this committed disciple being the one who very boldly says he's not going to believe unless he sees and experiences the resurrected Christ, unless he touches the wounds of Jesus. Why does Thomas do this? I can't help but wonder if what Thomas does is what any of the other disciples would have done. Had they not been there when Jesus appeared, I can't help but wonder, they wouldn't have been right there with Thomas. Maybe not as bold as Thomas in what they said, but doubting nonetheless. Unless they had also witnessed Christ. Maybe you can identify a bit with Thomas here. Maybe you have struggled at times with doubt and unbelief. It's important for us to recognize, friends, we are not born believing. We don't come out of the womb believing in the risen Christ. I talk to people about their faith all the time, and time after time I'll have people say to me, well, I've always believed. But the Scripture says that's not actually true. The Scripture says you've always known there was a God, but you haven't necessarily believed in that God. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 19, we read, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them, for His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. And the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. That means on this day when billions of people looked out over the horizon and they saw the sun rise they were accountable to a creator God that means when we see the majesty of creation all around us and we're in awe of it we are accountable to a creator God we know there is something greater than us we know that God exists that does not mean we believe and the risen Christ. In fact, the very next verse in Romans 1 tells us that. 
For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. That's why many today, when they saw the rising sun, they sought to worship a rising sun. That's why many today will not celebrate the resurrection. They will worship other things. They will worship even themselves. Because although we know that God exists, we become futile in our thinking and we turn from the living God. We are not born believing. Something needs to happen in order for us to move from, oh, isn't that a beautiful sunset, to oh, praise the risen King Jesus. And what needs to happen for us is what happened to Thomas. Jesus called him to believe. Which brings us to the next point there in your outline. Jesus calls us to believe in him. So Jesus visits the disciples a week later. And this time, Thomas is with them. And I love in this passage how Jesus directly goes to Thomas and directly goes to Thomas's earlier doubts and skepticism. And he immediately says to Thomas, Thomas, go ahead. Touch my wounds. And in that moment, Thomas knows that Jesus knows. And Jesus knows is responding to the exact, exact doubt that Thomas had. Friend, Jesus knows today the exact, exact doubts that you have. He knows the exact struggles that you have. And He is ready to meet those with the Gospel. And that's what we see Him do here with Thomas. He responds to Thomas's earlier requests. He essentially says to Thomas, you, you can touch my scars. And then he says specifically to him, do not disbelieve, but believe. Now, the exact translation of that passage is, Thomas, don't be an unbeliever, but be a believer. I find it interesting that in this passage, we see that Jesus here doesn't try to explain the resurrection to Thomas. And he doesn't dismiss false theories about what happened on the cross. <laughs> and he doesn't say to Thomas and the other disciples, now, now man, you, you might be thinking I just passed out for a while. Let me talk to you about that for a second. <laughs> and he doesn't say that at all. And he doesn't say to them, let me help you understand how I came back to life. No, he simply looks to Thomas, and after giving this offer to him, he says to him a command, Thomas, do not disbelieve, but believe. Jesus gives Thomas a command, and what does Thomas do? Verse 28, Thomas believes, and he says, My Lord and my God came across a book a number of years ago by a, a skeptic who was trying to explain that we've gotten it all wrong in our understanding in the New Testament. He unpacks in this book how we've just misunderstood what the disciples intended for us to understand, that they didn't really believe that Jesus was God. That when Jesus... Uh, when, excuse me, when statements were made by, like this by Thomas to Jesus, my Lord and my God, well, yeah, he said my God, but that's not really what he meant. They, they just thought Jesus was a man. We, we've gotten so carried away with all this, and this author was trying to correct that and say, well, we just need to reimagine, reinvent, revisit the New Testament, and if we read it in this way where when a disciple says my God, we interpret that as, well, he really went, meant something else. He didn't really mean he was God, but then we would have the right understanding. He's essentially saying that we today have a better understanding of the Scripture than the men who wrote it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit shortly after these events took place. There's a literary term for that. Hogwash. Thomas, when he says, my Lord and my God, 
he is making the very statement that Jesus was crucified for. He is saying Jesus is divine. He is saying Jesus is the Messiah. He is saying Jesus is fully God, fully man, master and Lord. Make no mistake about it. That's exactly how Thomas is responding here. And that's exactly, friend, how we are called to respond today. Because we have been given the same truth that was presented to Thomas. And we are called to respond in just the same way. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 tells us, So faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. If your ears are open this morning, if you can understand the words that I am saying to you, you are hearing the words of Christ read to you. You are hearing the gospel presented to you. And the scripture tells us that's how faith begins. That's how faith comes. It comes from hearing the words of Jesus. How do we move from disbelief to belief? We hear the gospel and we respond to it in repentance and faith. And what does the gospel tell us? The gospel tells us that we have all sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. Of God. The gospel tells us that the wages of that sin is death. But that God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners deserving of his wrath, Christ died for us. And if we will confess that Jesus is Lord just like Thomas did and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead just like Thomas did, we will be saved. That is the gospel. That is the truth of God's word. And upon hearing it, every one of us are accountable now to it to respond in repentance and faith. That is the call on our life. It was a call on Thomas's life. And he responded. And friends, what we see in the scripture, point three here, is that Jesus gives eternal life to all who believe in him. And that's the glorious truth we see in these closing verses. In verse 30 and 31, we see that Jesus did a lot more than was written in this book. <laughs> that's pretty impressive when you consider all the accounts that we're given here of the miracles and people being raised from the dead and He Himself being risen from the dead, that there's more that took place. But we don't have all of that. John says there's more. We don't have all that, but what does he say? But what we have here is absolutely enough for us to repent and believe. We don't need anything more. We don't need anything extra. And yet time and time again, I've had this same conversation. Perhaps you've had it with someone before. Where I'll go through the gospel and I'll talk to them about the scripture and and they'll say to me in one way or another, well, I'll tell you what, if Jesus would just, if he would just appear to me right now, I'd believe. I remember sitting in a dorm room at Western Kentucky University when I was a campus minister there, talking to student after student who would, who would say, they'd point to their door, they'd say, well, if Jesus just came walking through the door right now, I'd, I'd believe. I'd meet unbelief after unbelief after unbelief. I'd say, what would it take for you to believe? Well, if Jesus just showed up right now, I'd believe. And time and time again, I'd respond the same way. No, you wouldn't. Think of all those who encountered the living God and yet did not believe. Adam and Eve in the garden had perfect fellowship with God and they did not obey Him. They did not believe. We see throughout the Old Testament, time and time again, God's people having an encounter with the living God, and yet they would quickly turn back to their sin and false idols and not believe. Judas, <laughs> Judas heard every sermon that Jesus preached. And he didn't truly believe. Him. Friend, the Scripture tells us clearly this morning, Jesus tells us clear that this morning you don't need to see him walk through a door to believe in fact what does he tell us here 
Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You have everything. I have everything I need right here in front of me. And John says there's a lot more that could be written down. But listen, what you've got here is sufficient, verse 31, for you to believe that by believing you may have life in His name. And that's what this day is about. It's about remembering the resurrection of our Lord Jesus and the life we have in Him. That's what we're reminded of each and every Sunday and especially on this Resurrection Sunday. Many of you know that Last year, about this time, I lost my father to lung cancer. As I've been thinking about this Resurrection Sunday, I've been thinking a lot about my dad. I've been thinking a lot about memories of my dad. And one of my strongest memories of Resurrection Sunday with my dad is actually one that I don't have, but I've been told a lot about. I was about two years old, and my parents had just moved in to a new home. And it was Easter, and so we had Easter baskets And I opened up my basket as a young boy, and I found in there a chocolate bunny. And like most kids, when they find that chocolate bunny, I just opened that thing up and went right at it. And you know those chocolate bunnies, they're hollow on the outside, on the inside, but just that thin chocolate. Well, while nobody was looking, I took the bunny, I took one bite out of it, and then I dropped it. And it broke into about six pieces. And so I guess, as best I could understand at that age, What do you do with a broken chocolate bunny? Well, you flush it down the toilet. And so I took that broken bunny, I took it to the bathroom, this house we just moved into, I flushed it down the toilet, and then I just watched it for a while. And I watched as the water started to come up out of the toilet and decided it probably was best not to tell anyone about that. But they figured it out when about an inch of water was in the bathroom and it began to flood the hallway and flood the basement underneath. You can understand why that was a memorable Easter that we talked a lot about. As a young boy, I thought that something that was broken was useless. And some of us don't outgrow that thought. I'm sure there are some who would look to John chapter 20 and they would see here a broken disciple. They would see one here filled with doubts. That if anyone's going to be used by God moving forward, it's going to be these others who believed initially, not Thomas who said, unless I see these things, I'll never believe. Sure, he made that confession afterwards. But most of us would have put Thomas on the shelf at that point. But history tells us that's not what God did at all. History tells us that God took Thomas and he became one of the great missionaries of the faith that he took the gospel as far as India. In fact, today, this day in South India, there are churches there that can trace their roots all the way back to the missionary Thomas bringing the gospel to them. God would use him in marvelous and awesome ways. And he, like many of the other disciples, would be martyred for his faith. And church history tells us the way that Thomas was martyred for his faith was a spear was run through his side. Just imagine that for a moment. Here's the man who stood before Jesus and said, unless I put my hand in his side, and he dies with a spear running through his side, and in moments, instantaneously, as he took his last breath, he would then stand before the risen Christ. By his wounds, Thomas would be healed. Perhaps in that moment, Jesus put his hand on Thomas' side as he said, well done, my good and faithful servant. Many may call him doubting Thomas, but really what we should call him is believing Thomas. And that is the same thing you and I are called to today. To believe in the risen Christ. Friends, it is not sufficient this morning for you to say, well, well, I know God exists. I know all these things you're saying. But do you believe them? Have you put your trust in Christ? Is Christ Lord of your life today? 
Are you repentant of sin and trusting in Him? That's the call this Resurrection Sunday. That's the call each Lord's Day as we gather under His Word. So we invite you today to believe that Jesus indeed was raised from the dead and to confess Him as Lord. If you would stand together as I pray for us and as we respond to God's Word. (coughs) Father, You tell us clearly in the 20th chapter of John that These things are written that we might believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing we might have life in His name. I pray, God, that we would have that life today. That if any is yet to confess Christ as Lord, that this would be the day of salvation for them. And I pray for those who have confessed Jesus as Lord. Some in recent weeks, some in recent years, some decades ago. Lord, that you would strengthen our faith in these days. The very first words of the risen Christ in this passage were peace be with you. I pray that we would experience that peace today. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends and guests, we're going to offer time to respond to God's word as we sing before the throne of God above. And primarily, that's how we ask you to respond is through worship. But it may be that the Lord's leading you to come today and to confess Christ as Lord, to to take the next step in obedience of baptism, to start the process of joining this church family. It may be you just need someone to pray with you on this Resurrection Sunday. And I'd be honored to do that. Others would as well. So we invite you to come and we invite you to sing during this time of response as we sing together before the throne of God above.